Crude oil is a thick, dark brown liquid found deep in the Earth's crust. It's a mixture of different hydrocarbons, molecules made of hydrogen and carbon. Some molecules in the mixture are very small, just a few atoms joined together. Others are far more complex, with many atoms forming long-chain molecules. But as a mixture, it's useless. The different hydrocarbons need separating. The technique used is distillation. This simple apparatus is set up in a fume cupboard. Mineral wool stops the mixture spitting when it's heated. Crude oil is dropped into the bottom of the tube. A collecting bottle is put in place. And a thermometer, level with the sidearm, monitors temperature. The final step is to gently heat the mixture by immersing the tube in a hot water bath. The hydrocarbons with lower boiling points begin to vaporise immediately. They're flammable, so it's safer not to heat with a naked flame. As the vapour rises, it enters the sidearm, where it cools and condenses. This happens at about 40 Celsius. The hydrocarbons which boil at this temperature drip down the sidearm and form our first fraction. It's a colourless liquid. The temperature stays at around 40 until all the hydrocarbons with this boiling point have vaporised. The hydrocarbons left behind aren't hot enough to vaporise. Their boiling points must be higher. Once the first fraction has been collected, it's safe to start heating with a Bunsen. As the temperature rises, other hydrocarbons begin to boil. A new fraction is collected at about 60 Celsius. It's slightly yellow in colour. And so the process continues. By carefully heating the oil and collecting the liquids which condense at a number of different temperatures, the many different hydrocarbons in crude oil can be separated. This is known as fractional distillation. On a larger scale, a fractionating column is used. The oil is heated with an electric heater for safety. The vapour is condensed by a Liebig condenser and is collected in a conical flask. Hot vapour rises up the fractionating column. It's a long way to go, and the further from the heat source, the cooler it gets. Most of the vapour condenses on the glass spiral inside the column and drips back into the mixture. Only the hydrocarbons, which are still vapours at the very top of the column, enter the sidearm and condense to liquid. Industry uses the same process, but on a mammoth scale, in huge fractional distillation columns. The hot oil enters near the bottom at a temperature of 330 degrees Celsius. The column becomes cooler towards the top. Fractions which remain as vapour at 85 degrees Celsius go straight to the top and are piped away. Different hydrocarbons condense at different temperatures, running off at various levels. Those with lower boiling points are collected at the top those with higher boiling points run off nearer the bottom. The longer the molecules, the higher the boiling point. Industrial distillation separates crude oil into useful fractions, each containing molecules of a similar size. The planet is surrounded by an atmosphere of gases. One of the most important is oxygen. As well as supporting life, it's a very reactive element. 
This jar is full of oxygen. A glowing splint immediately relights. Oxygen reacts with most elements. Sulfur is a non-metallic element. When it's heated and plunged into oxygen, it burns with a characteristic blue flame and forms sulfur dioxide. Red phosphorus is another non-metal. When it's heated, it ignites. Plunge it into oxygen and it forms a thick white cloud of phosphorus 5 oxide. Adding water dissolves the oxides. Sulfur dioxide is a colourless gas. The white phosphorus 5 oxide has settled in the jar. A few drops of universal indicator test the pH. The solutions are both acidic. So how do metals behave? Sodium is a very reactive metal. It's stored under oil. Filter paper removes the oil and then it can be heated. Add it to oxygen and it forms white sodium oxide. Another reactive metal is magnesium. It burns in air with a bright light. Add it to oxygen and it burns spectacularly. The white powder that forms is magnesium oxide. Solutions of these metallic oxides turn universal indicator blue. There appears to be a pattern. The soluble oxides of non-metals produce acidic solutions, while soluble oxides of metals produce alkaline solutions. Oxygen only makes up about a fifth of our atmosphere. The rest is nearly all nitrogen. Just like oxygen, nitrogen gas is colourless and odourless, but it's fairly unreactive. It extinguishes a lit splint. Nitrogen gas liquefies at a very low temperature, so it has to be handled carefully. Liquid nitrogen can be used to freeze objects rapidly. On a small scale, it can also be used to liquefy air. A clean, dry test tube is dipped into liquid nitrogen. After about 15 minutes, a liquid appears in the tube. This is liquid air. As it warms, it starts to boil, and the gas evolved can be tested. At first, the gas extinguishes a lit splint. So, which gas could this be? But after four minutes, a glowing splint relights. What gas is boiling off now? Nitrogen boils at a slightly lower temperature than oxygen, so it vaporises first, leaving behind liquid oxygen. Because they have different boiling points, oxygen and nitrogen can be separated from air.
gold, silver and copper were amongst the first metals to be discovered. They can sometimes be found as pure metals in the Earth's crust. These sparkles are tiny pieces of pure gold. And the diagonal ridge in this rock is a vein of copper. But finding metals in their pure state is rare. Copper is usually found in rocks, combined with iron, sulphur and oxygen. This is copper oxide. To extract pure copper metal, oxygen has to be removed, a process known as reduction. One method is to use hydrogen as a reducing agent. Hydrogen gas from a cylinder is passed over the copper oxide. A mixture of hydrogen and air is explosive, but once all the air has been pushed out of the tube, it's safe to burn off the excess hydrogen. It burns so cleanly that it's hard to see the flame. Heat the copper oxide in this atmosphere of hydrogen and it quickly changes colour. Hydrogen reacts with oxygen in the copper oxide to form water. Copper metal is left behind. While the copper oxide is reduced, the hydrogen is oxidised. But as soon as the hydrogen and heat are removed, the reaction reverses. What's happening to the copper? Carbon is a much safer reducing agent. Mix it with copper oxide and simply heat in a boiling tube. Carbon reacts with oxygen in the copper oxide and solid copper forms. Carbon is more reactive than copper. It's able to remove the oxygen and form carbon dioxide. While the copper oxide is reduced, the carbon is oxidised. So, can other metal oxides be reduced by carbon? A mixture of lead oxide and carbon is heated strongly for several minutes. Beads of pure molten lead form in the tube. But heat a mixture of iron oxide and carbon and nothing happens. Why does carbon reduce copper and lead oxides but leave iron oxide unchanged?